to Chile. Estonia's Communist Party staged a coup that failed. By this time in the 1930s, there were severe economic problems inside the Soviet Union, as there were everywhere else in the world, but this didn't halt subversive activities internationally. At the 7th Congress of the Communist International, which was held in Moscow in 1935, the new Comintern leader, Dimitrov, called for a popular front against fascism. Communist parties that had been denouncing liberals and socialists urged an alliance to stop the spread of fascism in Italy and Germany. Well, things changed dramatically when Joseph Stalin succeeded Lenin as the leader of the Soviet Union in 1924. He ruled for nearly 30 years and used executions, purges, imprisonment, famine, forced relocation, and other methods to stay in power. Stalin is alleged to have said, death solves all problems. No man, no problem. Well, whether or not he said it, whether or not he said it, his results speak for himself. There were an estimated 7 million people who died in the forced famine in the Ukraine, the Holdemar, And the Great Terror of 1936 to 1938 included sham trials and executions that took an estimated additional million lives. Many incriminated themselves to end the sham trials. Millions more died in the Gulag, which were an enormous system of forced labor camps. By late 1938, just about all effective opposition to Stalin, whether real or imagined, had been silenced. At that time, World War II began. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Non-Aggression Pact of August 1939 was one of Stalin's first serious attempts at imperial expansion. He thought that a treaty with Germany would provoke a major European war. And according to the book A Brief History of the Cold War, Soviet archives reveal that Stalin planned to dominate Europe with the help of Hitler's war machine and then hopefully eliminate Germany as a rival for, quote, total hegemony over the continent. This plan caused a division in the foreign members of the Comintern. Some communists, like the American spy Whitaker Chambers, rejected Moscow's imperial commands and left the party. Stalin's first objective, following the pact with Germany, was to eliminate any opposition in the new territories of the Soviet Empire. There were orders that went out for the liquidation of nationalists, Trotskyites, and Christian and Social Democrats in the Balkan states. In April 1940, 22,000 Polish prisoners including officers, civil servants, landowners, priests, and policemen, were executed. Brian Crozier writes, they were lined up, made to dig their own mass graves, and shot in the back of the neck. They were buried in locations in Ukraine and Belarus. In late June, Hitler invaded Russia, which turned the USSR into an American ally. Roosevelt immediately extended Lend-Lease terms to the Soviets, and the U.S. provided substantial aid to them in the months before Pearl Harbor and afterwards. In order to attract Western support for its fight against Hitler, Moscow dissolved the Comintern in 1943, which was a gesture that suggested it abandoned its goals of worldwide revolution. Stalin told the Allies that he saw only socialism in one country. But that wasn't what happened after the war closed. In the final months of the war, as Germany's defenses were crumbling, Russia's army advanced on a thousand-mile-wide front. They took Warsaw, pushed into Germany from the north and the south, moved into Hungary and Czechoslovakia, and threatened Vienna. The Soviet advance gave Moscow a huge bargaining advantage when Stalin met with Roosevelt and British Prime Minister Winston Churchill at Yalta in the Crimean Peninsula in early 1945 to discuss issues such as the future of Europe and war in the Pacific. Churchill wanted to restrict the expansion of Soviet power in Europe, while Stalin wanted to extend Soviet influence as far westward as possible. Roosevelt wanted a democratic Europe, but his attention was focused on the Pacific. Roosevelt and Churchill based their proposals of post-World War Europe on the expectation that communists and non-communists in a country such as Poland or Czechoslovakia could form a regime like the Popular Front governments in Europe before the war. In order to reach this, it would require the full cooperation of the Soviet Union, which Roosevelt and Churchill thought would come. It seemed that the Americans and the British got what they wanted at Yalta. The Soviets agreed to enter the war against Japan within three months after Germany's surrender. Stalin knew that he was joining a war that would require a minimal amount of military commitment, but allowed him to share in the victory. He also agreed to compromise on questions of membership in a new international organization, the United Nations, which Roosevelt thought would manage things effectively after World War II. It's at the Yalta negotiations where Germany was divided into its four occupation zones, one each for the U.S., Great Britain, the Soviet Union, and France. 
But on the issue of who would govern Poland, Stalin refused to recognize the non-communist government in exile that had been working out of London for the past six years. Instead, he recognized the government the Soviets had set up in Lublin. Roosevelt and Churchill accepted ambiguous language about the makeup of a future Polish government, and Stalin's promise of a free and unfettered elections in the near future was an agreement that Roosevelt Chief of Staff Admiral William Leahy dismissed as so elastic that the Russians can stretch it all the way from Yalta to Washington without breaking it. Stalin also agreed to establish interim governments, which he called broadly representative of all democratic elements, and the rest of liberated Europe, Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, and Romania, to be followed by free elections. The agreement was part of a grandiose Declaration on Liberated Europe, drafted by the Americans, which the Soviet leader was content to sign after Roosevelt announced that all American forces would leave Europe within two years. Well, by March 1945, Churchill wrote to Roosevelt that nearly everything they agreed to at Yalta was unraveling, while Roosevelt was having second thoughts about the Soviet leader. When he found out that elections in Eastern Europe would be held Soviet-style, he said, Avril Harriman is right. We can't do business with Stalin. He's broken every one of the promises he made at Yalta. But nevertheless, FDR's messages to Churchill for the rest of March and into April were intended to placate the prime minister. He didn't want the U.S. and Great Britain to be seen as opposing Stalin, whose commitment to the war in the South Pacific he and his military advisors considered essential for victory, and they didn't want World War II to stretch on for years and years and lead to the possible deaths of millions of American servicemen there. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. In his final message to Churchill, Roosevelt said, I would minimize a general Soviet problem as much as possible because these problems, in one form or another, seem to arise every day, and most of them straighten out, as in the case of the Bern meeting, concluding, we must be firm, however, and our course thus far is correct. Well, on April 12th, the president died of a cerebral hemorrhage, and the conduct of U.S. foreign policy abruptly shifted to his vice president of just three months, Harry Truman. All right, well, that is my massive introduction, setting up the stage for the Cold War. Russia obviously expands after World War II, and many countries in Eastern Europe and Central Asia come under Soviet occupation, and they become part of the USSR. Now, there's a lot that I could say about the presidencies of Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, Kennedy, Nixon, Johnson, and Carter, and everything else. But I'm going to jump ahead to the 1980s, because the question is about the end of the Cold War. So as there's necessary elements of this long history that I'm skipping over when I describe these events of the 80s and early 90s, I'll try to fill them in as best as possible. But anyway, I just wanted to set the stage for the ideological clash that's occurring at this time. And all I'll say to fill in the gaps is that there's an enormous amount of military buildup, hundreds of billions of dollars, nuclear weapons placed around the globe. I think if people have a vague understanding about the Cold War, they understand these aspects, the nuclear threat. So without further ado, let's jump ahead to the 1980s. Ronald Reagan permanently changed the course of the Cold War when he took office in 1981. This followed a series of victories for the Soviet Union throughout the 1970s including martial law in Poland imposed by a communist regime, the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan, the Sandinista revolt in Nicaragua, communist rule in Mozambique and Angola, Marxist takeovers in Ethiopia and South Vietnam. Everything basically looked like the Soviet Union had created a world-class military establishment. And NATO was strained by the 1970s. The Soviet Union had deployed SS-20 intermediate-range nuclear missiles that were aimed at all major European cities. So, in response, NATO proposed a dual-track approach. Negotiations to remove the missiles and the deployment of U.S. Pershing II and cruise missiles aimed at Soviet cities. And there was a popular protest in Western Europe against this, and some think that the Kremlin aided and abetted these protests. So, in his early rhetoric as president, Reagan said that he considered communism to be a disease and regarded the Soviet government as illegitimate. When he summed up the aims of his foreign policy, he simply said, we win and they lose. Now, this rattled many foreign policy establishment figures because from the outside, the Soviet Union did appear economically strong, and it was definitely militarily powerful. After visiting Moscow in 1982, Harvard professor Arthur Schlesinger said, those in the U.S. who think the Soviet Union is on the verge of economic and social collapse, ready with one small push to go over the brink, are only kidding themselves. 
But based on his own intelligent reports, Reagan believed that communism was cracking and ready to crumble. In his first year, Reagan chaired 57 meetings of the National Security Council, and he thought, similar to Harry S. Truman's outlook, that America shouldn't accommodate the Kremlin and thought that the United States should only negotiate with the Soviets from the position of strength. Reagan directed his top national security team, CIA Director William Casey, Defense Secretary Caspar Weinberger, National Security Advisor Richard Allen, and others to develop a plan to end the Cold War by winning it. So the Pentagon produced a defense guidance for resource and force planning with two objectives. First, reverse the geographic expansion of Soviet control and military presence throughout the world by doing such things as funding the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and other places in Central America. And second, encourage long-term political and military changes within the Soviet Union. A subset of the strategy was called the Reagan Doctrine, which was coined by the columnist Charles Crothamer, which departed from the previous policy of containment by just stopping the spread of communism in different countries. Instead, it approved U.S. support of anti-communist forces in Afghanistan, Nicaragua, Angola, and Cambodia. These groups were given funds and weapons, and it pushed containment to its logical conclusion by helping those that oppose communism. The purpose of the policy was to pressure Soviets at their economic and military weak spots. A crucial turning point was 1983 for the Cold War. Reagan announced the development and deployment of a comprehensive anti-ballistic missile system, which later was coined Star Wars. He said, I call upon the scientific community in our country, those who gave us nuclear weapons, to turn their great talents now to the cause of mankind and world peace, to give us the means of rendering these nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. It was called the Strategic Defense Initiative, a way to nullify nuclear weapons, and it was an alternative to the policy of mutually assured destruction, in which the U.S. and the Soviet Union had the ability to destroy each other. If one person attacked first with nuclear weapons, the other could also attack. And this policy was what Reagan's defense secretary, Caspar Weinberger, called a mutual suicide pact. Well, SDI never worked effectively, but Yuri Andropov, who succeeded Brezhnev as leader of the USSR in 1982, called it a strike weapon and a preparation for a U.S. nuclear attack. The book A Brief History of the Cold War writes that Moscow's intense opposition to SDI showed that Soviet scientists regarded it not as a pipe dream, but a technological feat they couldn't match. A decade later, General Mahmoud Gharib, who headed the Department of Strategic Analysis in the Soviet Ministry of Defense, said what he had told the Politburo. Not only could we not defeat SDI, SDI defeated all our possible countermeasures. In 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev became General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. He immediately wanted to launch a campaign of reform. Seventy years after the Bolshevik Revolution, economic growth was stagnant, the collective farms weren't able to feed the people, most factories didn't meet their quotas, and people were lined up for blocks in Moscow and other cities in order to get basic necessities. The war in Afghanistan was dragging on with no end in sight and consuming resources like crazy. There were new groups forming in Eastern Europe in opposition to the Soviet Union, such as Solidarity in Poland and Chapter 77 in Czechoslovakia. Three months before he took office, Gorbachev reassured Communist Party officials that his goal was to ensure that the Soviet Union began the 21st century, he said, in a manner worthy of a great power. In May 1986, he tried to speed up socialism by improving the quality of goods, retooling industries, and even trying to reduce alcoholism through central planning. His initial reform programs didn't work, but Gorbachev said, we're not giving up on socialism. We want to make it better. And there's a lot of talk about Gorbachev's reform programs, but I think it would be a mistake to say that he was a capitalist in the making. He would frequently quote the Communist Manifesto throughout his reign, and he quoted as late as 1988 when he was asked about his position on private property. So the purpose of his reforms were not to slowly introduce capitalism in the Soviet Union, but in order to strengthen and stabilize the Soviet regime. His next reform program was called Perestroika, which means restructuring. It was a new economic plan that would give people more economic freedom, but the Soviet Union didn't have entrepreneurs or free market experience from a capitalist past in order to fully take advantage of these. What would most resemble at the Soviet Union at the time was a very large black market from people who stole resources from the state and then sold it to others who needed it. If perestroika was an attempt to open things up from the top, 
then glasnost 